Hey friend, welcome to the broadcast today. And you know, I know I say it all the time, but this is a message that just has the potential to change your life. Give God's word your undivided attention. Put it first in your life and you will reap benefits from it. The book, in the book of Job, Job said, Lord, I've esteemed your words more than my necessary bread. And when we take that kind of an attitude about the bread of life, the word of God, friend, it pours rich blessings into our life. So if you've got a Bible, grab it. And we're going to get into the scriptures together. Acts chapter 27 and verse 9. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, now the fast speaks of the Jewish Day of Atonement, which was already over, which puts this somewhere in early October. And the ancient mariners considered navigation on the Mediterranean unsafe from early October all the way through the middle of March. And Paul is about to warn them against proceeding in this journey, but his advice is based on more than natural knowledge. Look again in the end of verse 9. Paul advised them saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. He said, I perceive. It was an inward perception, an inward impression, if you would. If you would. It was nothing he saw or heard outwardly that would have led him to that conclusion. In fact, everything else contradicted Paul's perception. In verse 11, it says, this, Nevertheless, the centurion, and he was the one in charge, was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. So as we read the next few verses, we find the centurion, the one making the ultimate decision, was more persuaded by three things rather than by Paul's warning not to proceed. And the first one we read right there in verse 11, the experts. There's the helmsman or the, the pilot, the captain of the ship and the owner of the ship. They knew the seas, they knew the seasons, and they knew the ship. They were the experts and their advice was we need to go. And then in verse 12, it says, And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also. If by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and northwest, and winter there. So it's not just the experts. The whole majority advised that they set sail as well. And then in verse 13, And when the south wind blew softly, Supposing they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by creek. Verse 13, now all the circumstances line up. The, the breeze begins blowing in the correct direction, and it seems like they have an open door circumstantially. So you have the experts pointing this direction. You have the majority pointing this direction. And all the circumstances in the open doors are pointing this direction. And Paul's perception is pointing in the other direction. And then we read the next couple of verses, verse 14. It says, But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurachlodon. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. The experts were wrong. The majority was wrong. And the circumstances and, quote, the open doors, the south wind that blew softly was wrong. And the only thing that was right was Paul's perception. Now, Paul didn't say, God told me. He didn't say, thus saith the Lord. He said, I perceive. He had an inward perception, an inward impression, if you would. Call it that still, small voice. Call it the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. You know, call it, you know, whatever. But God does lead all of his children through those inward impressions, inward perceptions. And we need to learn to listen to that, that inward witness, that inward prompting of the Spirit. How much heartache 
and grief and loss could be avoided if God's children would just learn to listen to those inward impressions and perception. But just like the centurion, there are many things that would push us to disregard those inward impressions. It might be someone like the owner of the ship. I'm sure he's thinking, time is money. I've got to get my cargo to Rome. If it doesn't get to Rome, I can't get paid. And so there's this pressure. And sometimes you've got to do something now. got to do something now. The window of opportunity is closing. You've got to do something now. My advice to you, if you're being you know, harangued like that and voices are saying, do it now, do it now, you need to stop, do not pass go, do not collect $200. You need to wait. Or maybe the centurion, maybe it was a matter of pride. Maybe he didn't want to appear weak or afraid for sailing. Our pride gets us into a lot of trouble sometimes. Or maybe we're just too busy to really get quiet and listen and look inside and, God, are you saying anything to my heart about this? We're just so caught up in our frenetic pace that we never take time to get quiet. Or maybe it's that whole majority thing. As much as we like to think we're different than the pack, it is much harder to go against the majority influence than most people will admit. When everyone's facing this way and you have an inward prompting to turn around and face the other way, it can be difficult to go against the grain and go against you know, the majority's influence. But it does pay to listen to those inward promptings and per perceptions and inward impressions. And as I said, we could avoid much heartache and grief if we would just learn to listen. Drop down with me, if you would, to verse 20. We read a little bit more about the storm. It says, Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. They had no sextant, no compass. They didn't know where they were. It was total darkness, no light of the sun. A star didn't appear. And finally, after many days in this storm, they gave up all hope. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you feel like you're just in the dark, being buffeted by a storm, and you have given up hope of things ever changing and your situation ever getting better and you're just ready to cash it in. Well, I just want to tell you something. Don't you give up because there is hope and help coming your way. Look what happens next. Verse 22. Now, and Paul is speaking. Or actually, look at verse 21. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Now, he wasn't saying, I told you so. He was just saying that to them so that they would be receptive for what he's about to say next. Verse 22, And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So in the midst of this situation where everyone has given up hope, Paul stands in the midst and he says, Hey, be of good courage. Take heart. Why? Because we have a very experienced captain and he'll get us out of this. No. Because we have a really sturdy ship. No. Because we have a lot of clever people on board and if we just pool our ideas, we can come up with a way to get out of this dilemma. No. Paul said, be of good courage, take heart, because God has said something about our circumstance. I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. Take heart. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor, that really doesn't encourage me that much. I mean, Paul had an angel appear to him and give him a promise from God. If I had an angelic appearance and maybe had a, a specific promise from God, I, I, I'd be encouraged as well. You got something better than an angelic appearance, my friend. You have the written word of God. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, hey, 
We were eyewitnesses of the majesty and glory of God. And in the mountain when God spoke, we heard his voice with our ears. He said, but we have a more sure word than that. Even the scriptures that are of no private interpretation. Friend, this written word is more sure than if an angel appeared to you. It is more sure than if you heard the audible voice of God. Heaven and earth may pass away, but His word will not pass away. It is forever settled in heaven, and God has already said something about your circumstance in His word. You can hang on to His promise, and it will get you through the storm. You know, Joshua, near the end of his life, said to the people as they gathered around, he says, not one promise of God has failed us. All has come to pass. And I'm telling you, his word is a sure foundation. And if you're in a storm right now, friend, you need to find a promise in the book and anchor your hope on that promise. Now, Having said that, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes, and this is really the heart of the message. Just some practical lessons we can learn from this story about the storm. And the first one is just a thought. What kind of people end up in storms? It must be bad people. People that God is really displeased with, like Jonah. Disobedient Jonah. Serves you right, Jonah. Glad you're in a storm. Well, Jonah was in a vicious storm for disobeying God. Paul finds himself in a vicious storm for obeying God. Remember the word of the angel to him, you must be brought before Caesar. He was following the plan of God for his life. He was on assignment from God. And he was in a terrible storm. And the truth is this, bad storms sometimes happen to good people. We live in a fallen world, so don't overanalyze it. Storms happen. It's just part of life. It doesn't mean God is displeased with you and you've fallen out of favor with God. Storms happen to everyone. And then secondly, we cannot dictate God's method of deliverance. Now, God did deliver Paul and all those with him, but it was not in the way most people would choose. And I read in the scripture several ways God delivered people from storms. In John chapter 6, you know, Jesus is walking on the water and there's this terrible storm, and the Bible says they received him into their boat and immediately they were at the shore where they were going. This, this translation miracle took place. That's my favorite way to get out of a storm. Man, it's just miracle, instantaneous, no work, no effort on my part, just bang, God, you're awesome. <laughs> but then we read in, in Luke chapter 8, another terrific storm, and Jesus rebukes the wind, and there's a great calm. But they don't get translated to shore. They still have to row, or if they can find a breath of wind, they've got to put the sails up and sail it. And that, that kind of deliverance from a storm, there's an amazing breakthrough that God gives and then that which is hard suddenly becomes easy. Not having to row against the wind and the waves anymore. And sometimes that's the form God's deliverance takes. It's, there's this breakthrough and suddenly, you know, where there was resistance, you find favor, but it still requires effort and cooperation on our part. And then there's storms like the one Paul was in. Nothing immediate, no calm. They lost the ship, they lost the cargo, but their lives were saved. And you know, the storm never did stop. Even after they were shipwrecked and got to shore, the Bible says it was still raining. You can read in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, Paul said, I was shipwrecked three times. You can't always orchestrate how things are going to play out. Sometimes... God does it instantly, miraculously. It's amazing. Sometimes there's a breakthrough and things become easy. And sometimes the storm just eventually blows itself out. And whichever way God's deliverance shapes up in your life, you can have an underlying confidence that God will get you through and bring blessing 
before it's finished. I remember listening to a contractor one time. He had been chosen to build a large ministry headquarters and, you know, great ministry. And he figured, I'm doing this for the glory of God. I'm using my gifts, you know, for the glory of God. And he was. But just as they began to work, it started to rain. And it rained and rained and rained and rained. And he went to the head of this ministry who's been in heaven for many years now. And he said, what's going on? You know, I, I got this project and we've bound the clouds and loosed the sunshine and we've prayed that the rain would stop and we've fasted, but it just keeps raining. And I still remember what he said were the, the pearls of wisdom that dropped from the lips of this sagely legendary man of God. He said, well... Sometimes it rains, sometimes it don't. <laughs> and friend, whether it's raining or the sun is shining, storm or calm, I believe that God is going to bring me through and at the end of my life I'm going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, and I will have completed the assignment that God has given me. Now, if it happens to be one of those where the storm just seems to keep going on, it doesn't mean you don't actively pursue deliverance. We, we must still actively pursue deliverance in the storm. I mean, it's a given. Even though it doesn't say Paul was praying, it's a given that he was seeking God. It's understood that he was praying. What I'm warning against is us trying to put God in a box and somehow orchestrate exactly how he is going to bring this thing to pass. We have to leave that part to God. Our part is just to hold on to the promise and say, I believe God that it's going to be just as it was told me. And here's another thought. There's mercy in the mess. You know, they had missed God. They could have avoided the storm altogether, but they wouldn't listen. And you know, even though Paul initially warned them, I perceive that this voyage is going to be with much life, not only the cargo and ship, but also of our lives, God very mercifully spared everyone's life, all 276 people aboard the ship. And maybe you're in a mess right now because you didn't listen to God. Maybe you disobeyed Him. Well, you know what? If you will repent if you need to, seek Him and petition Him, in the midst of your storm, even though, if it, even though it's self-inflicted, I'm telling you, our God is a gracious God. He is a merciful and kind God, and He will help you. There's mercy in the mess, even when the mess is one of our own creating. Due to our own negligence, due to our own insensitivity, or even our own disobedience, God is merciful. How many are glad of that? Oh, man, I am. What a God of mercy he is. And then, here's one. God, who appointed the end, also appointed the mean. Would you read with me? Look again, verse 27. We ended in verse 26, where he said, we must run aground on a certain island. Verse 27, now when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. And they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. And the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. Now the sailors were like the hirelings Jesus spoke about that would flee when the wolf came. The sailors were trying to escape from the ship when they were needed most. Now, didn't God say, didn't the word of the angel say, God has granted you all those who sail with you? Answer that question, yes. So Paul, what do you mean by saying, unless these men stay on board, you can't be saved? Hasn't God already said and promised that everyone's going to be saved? Yes, he has, but God, who appointed the end, 
also appointed the means. And when, God, when Paul made that statement, that unless they stay on board, you can't be saved, I don't think he's speaking of as a prophet, speaking as a prophet, but as a prudent man. Because he'd already said and had been revealed to him, we're going to have to run the ship aground. All right, if the sailors abandon ship, who's going to steer the ship so that it can run aground? You see, God appointed the ends, but he also appointed the means. And as we read on, we find out that, you know, in the morning they saw a beach there, and those same sailors that were going to abandon ship, they knew what to do with the rudders, they knew what to do with the sails, and they steered the ship where it got into a place, and finally it ran aground, began to break up, and people were able to jump off and get to shore, but they never would have gotten in close enough to make it to shore if the sailors weren't there to sail the ship in. There's such a lesson here for us. We tempt God when we say that we trust Him and claim to be under His protection, yet we don't use the proper means when at our disposal for our preservation and our safety. Just an example of what I mean. I was just in Germany preaching a couple of the days there. It was very cold and rainy. And I'd preach, you know, late into the night and greet people and just, I'd be just soaked with perspiration. So now i got to go to the hotel. So am I going to walk out in that rainy, wet, freezing weather and say, hey, I don't need my hat, I don't need my coat, I don't need my scarf, the Lord is my shelter. <laughs> See you guys back at the hotel. No, you walk out in a night like that, especially when you're soaked with perspiration, that's how you get pneumonia. I put on my coat, I bundled up, I put my scarf on, I put my hat on, and I got right into the vehicle and went to the hotel. I didn't walk out in the rainy weather, especially after I'd, you know, gotten, you know, all sweaty and, and, and you know, used so much energy preaching. It would have been foolish. And I could claim God's my protection, you know, God is my shelter. No, it would have been tempting God to do that. If I have to take a little plane somewhere to preach and the pilot says, man, the engine's been cutting out a lot lately, we got this severe oil leak. But come on, we're going to trust God. No thanks, I'll take the 15-hour bus ride, thank you. What's the matter? Don't you have any faith? Yes, I have faith. Why don't we get a mechanic to fix a plane? Do you know how expensive that is? Come on, Matthew 18, 19. If any two of us agree on earth, let's just pray and agree we'll be safe. Why don't we pray and agree for the money to pay the mechanic to fix the plane? And once he fixes the plane, I'll ride with you. God who appoints the ends also appoints the means. Let's read on. Verse 33. And as the day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day you've waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. That's a long time to not eat. Two weeks. It's been a long storm. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. Now, again, this is just practical wisdom. Maybe they were seasick. You know, in the storm, they can't have a fire, so anything they eat is going to be cold. Maybe they weren't hungry. But you know what? They haven't eaten for two weeks. Paul knows the ship's going to run aground. They're going to have to swim for it. You need the energy. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to swim to shore. Get something to eat. Practical knowledge. Practical wisdom. And as well, just, just a thought. I think probably they had not been eating because they'd lost hope. You know, when a deep depression takes hold of a person, one of the symptoms of that is they stop taking care of themselves. They stop eating. They stop bathing. And if you know somebody that's shown those kind of signs, you need to do what Paul did. You need to encourage them. It can lead to disastrous results if someone doesn't intervene in there. It's usually a symptom that a, that a dark depression or a hopelessness has gotten a hold of someone. It's, it's usually some of the first physical signs. They lose their appetite. And they stop caring for themselves. And if somebody doesn't step in and encourage them, who will? Now, Paul said, you're not going to lose your hair, but your hair is going to get wet. Verse 35. When he said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he'd broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, there were 276 persons in the ship. 
276 people encouraged by Paul, influenced by Paul, ultimately saved because of his presence. How many people can one person that loves God and serves God influence? Your family? Yes, you can influence them. Your church? Yes. Your company? Yes. Your community? Yes. Your country? Yes. Don't underestimate the encouraging power and the preserving power and the good influence God can have through you. And listen, if you're in a storm today, I just want to tell you this. Things may not be going according to plan, but that doesn't mean God doesn't have a plan. Things may not be going the way you envisioned at all, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan and a way to get you through. And I believe at the end, something amazing can happen. If we had time, we go into the next chapter. You know, they get shipwrecked on the island and, and a healing revival breaks out and, and turns out with a, an island full of healed converts. And just maybe the storm that the devil sent to destroy you is going to take you to the shores of the greatest blessing in God you have ever found before. And God is going to use you more than he's ever used you before. Friend, don't give up hope. And if you're in a titanic storm right now, listen, God is with you. He loves you. Don't give up. I believe you're going to come out on the other end. It may not be the way you would have orchestrated it, but God will not fail you. His promises are true. He loves you, and He is going to see you through. You know, one of the great things I've learned about God is that He actually knows what's going on, and He has a better plan than I do. God is not unaware of your circumstance, your situation, your storm. He knows about it. He knows what you're going through. And the Bible says that before, you know, we're embroiled in our troubles, and Paul wrote this to the Corinthians, that God also makes a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. There's no temptation, no trouble, no trial, no problem, no storm that, that, that we've encountered. But God hasn't already made a way of escape. God hasn't already provided a plan to get through it, to conquer it. We just need to listen for His wisdom, look to His Word, and I want to tell you, in your storm, there is a way through. God will not forsake you. The, the lightning may be flashing, the rain may be falling, the wind may be howling. But friend, God will not forsake you. He will not leave you. There is a way through your problems. Don't give up hope, my friend. And just, you know, this may be out there a bit, but I'm just going to say it. God would set this entire broadcast up just to encourage you right now. He knows what you're going through, and He loves you. See you next time.